One of the main official requirements is that thermometers be in level open clearing with typical ground cover. And 89% of the surveyed thermometers in North America fail that. We haven't done, we haven't organised a, a survey here in Australia yet, but just from going around uh, sort of 10 or so uh, thermometers here in Australia, some fail disastrous, but some are quite good and some are in between. This thermometer is parked near a, a little river of decomposing sewage. The bacteria give off heat, so that's an excellent place to measure global warming. <laughs> this is in Florida. As you can see, that's, that's open level ground with, with uh, ground cover typical of the region. <laughs> Urban heat islands are pretty important because the microclimate in a, in a city gradually changes so there are more cars and buildings and so on. In a city of a million, you can boost the temperature by about 1 to 3 degrees on average and up to 12 degrees on summer evenings. Naturally, a lot of thermometers in the cities. This thermometer is in a city. This is, on, this is in Baltimore, on top of a large building. The thermometer is about there. I suppose the curious point about this thermometer is there's a whole bunch of air conditioners just a few feet away there. I, why couldn't they at least move the thermometer up the top of the other end of the building, away from the, the, the air conditioners? And these guys aren't even trying. This is a local, event, uh, uh, a local example. This was Observatory Hill in Sydney in 1858. This is when the uh, weather station here started, the temperature station started here. The population of Sydney at the time was about 60,000. This is where it is today. It's moved down the hill a little bit, but it's still the same temperature station. As you can see, it's right in the middle of those red arrows. As you can see, there are a few other influences, now, influences nowadays. Do you suppose that thermometer is measuring global warming or the growth of Sydney? 54% of the thermometers on a world scale are at airports. I'll just pick one airport. The thermometer here is where those red arrows are pointing, next to the edge of the runway. So it gets a bit of extra warming from uh, aircraft, de-icing machines, and the tar back giving back heat at night. That's terrific if you're measuring the heat of the, t of, the, uh, of the runway for the aircraft. But if you want to measure the temperature of northern Norway, you should stick the thermometer out in the snow somewhere out here. You don't need a PhD, and you don't need to be a climate scientist to realise that that's not the right thing to do. So what difference does it make? This is the temperature record beloved by the alarmists. It comes from the Goddard Institute of Space Studies, GIS. Despite the name, there are no satellite records involved in this, in this, uh, in this temperature record. The temperature record goes from 1979 through to a few months ago. It, shows a, it paints a picture of gradually rising temperatures. The warmest year was about 2006, and the warming trend looks like it's continuing, right? That's what the politicians are being told, and that's what the politicians tell us. They think they have a major problem on their hand. This is the politically convenient picture. As I mentioned, satellites can also take the temperature. They do it in an unbiased fashion, nearly everywhere, nearly all the time. They say something significantly different. Let's point out the differences. Graphs from 1979 to a few months ago, as before, this time the rising trend goes to somewhere around about 2001, where that big red smudge that I drew is, and then it kind of levels off. And the other big feature is that the El Nino in 1998 was the largest year. Sure, we had another big El Nino in 2010, but that's passed and the temperature's well below that average red line in the level section now. This picture is very politically inconvenient to the whole carbon dioxide project being run by governments. If people simply knew this, they'd say, well, why bother with the carbon tax? Let's get to the core of the matter. The core of the matter is the missing hotspot, because this was the first bit of four bits of evidence. I'm only going to talk about this bit of evidence. Chris is going to talk briefly about the other three. But this is the first bit of evidence that should have alerted the climate science world to the fact that their theory was bunk. This comes right out of their document. This is the fourth assessment, commonly fourth assessment report of the IPCC in 2007. The first five diagrams show what they say is the atmospheric warming pattern due to various causes. The sixth one is the one I'd draw your attention to, part F. This is what they say happened in the warming of the last two or three decades. On the vertical scale is height above sea level. That's about 10 kilometres up. The scale goes on the left, the north, uh, near the North Pole, middle of the equator, South Pole at the uh, right-hand edge. The salient fe feature here is that big red spot over the tropics at about 10 kilometres up. That's the hot spot. That's what all the models show, and 
that contributes about two thirds of the warming in the climate models. So, weather balloons, millions of weather balloons, what did they find? That's reality for you folks. Same sort of diagram. No hotspot. That little red marker, oh, there it is. At that point, the climate scientists sort of backed off and said, oh, there's something wrong with the theory. The guess we made back in 1980 was wrong. Good news, world. It's not warming. We're going to be warming up nearly as much as from our carbon dioxide as we thought. Back off. There's, there's, there's no alarm. But they didn't. Let's just put them side by side just to reinforce the picture. There's reality on one side, the climate models on the others. I, th I think you get the idea that the climate models are fundamentally flawed and they exaggerate the future warming. So, what does the establishment say? Well, until 2006, they just ignored the problem, didn't tell anyone. Finally, they published that, that, uh, the graph of the weather balloons in a fairly obscure place. Then they went through a couple of years of denying the data. They said, oh, the weather balloons make so many mistakes. You know, it's, there could be a hotspot there, we just wouldn't know about it. But people pointed out that there were just millions of hotspots, and there's no way they all missed the hotspots, so that wasn't credible. So instead, 10 years after they got the data, they discovered the hotspot. Who knew? This is by Steve Sherwood. <coughs> he spent a few years at Yale University. He is now at New South Wales Climate Centre. He's one of our main climate researchers. This is his graph. He found the hotspot. There's something wrong with that graph. Some of you may know what it is. Some of you may spot it. The problem is not up here, where you'd think to look. The problem is over here on the scale. See how the colour of zero change is red? <laughs> fraud! Exactly, they're desperate, it's fraud. It's the old colour scale trick. It's the colouring in trick. It fools the politicians and the willing media. The colour of zero change is red, so if the atmosphere all changed temperature widely, uh, sorry, sorry, if the, if the temperature was exactly the same and the atmosphere did not change at all, his whole graph would be red. Good on you, Steve Sherwood. Also, his hotspot's too faint, and he threw away the, the thermometer information and instead he used the wind measurements on the, on the radio songs to work out the temperature, which is a bit sus in itself, dead in mind. So, what happens when I mention the hotspot in, say, a radio interview? I get a chance every now and then, so I mention it dutifully. Well, what happens is the media always gives some CSIRO bot the last word. These CSIRO bots use the last word to claim they have found the hotspot or any one of a dozen other irrelevant or easily refuted responses. Essentially, they use a reassuring, authoritative voice to say, trust us. Their predictions. These are the predictions that they made in 1998 to the US Congress. They're in black. What subsequent reality is shown in red from the satellite data. The black lines, there are three of them. Scenario A is of interest because that's what Hansen said would happen if the world kept emitting carbon dioxide on its current trajectory. That is in fact what happened. Obviously the temperatures are way below that. Scenario C is what they said would happen if the world cut back on its carbon emissions immediately in 1998, such that by year 2000 the atmospheric carbon dioxide level had stopped going up at all. Subsequent temperatures are even below that. So I think it's fair to say that their models don't know what's going on with respect to carbon dioxide. As I mentioned, this is the land thermometer record. It shows a heating and cooling alternative pattern that's been going on. Every 25 or 30 years it goes from global warming to global cooling. This is a bit stretched out because it uses those corrupt thermometers, but it still gives the picture. Very clever... A researcher, Dr. S Professor Sayan Akasufu of the Arctic Research Centre, pointed out that since the end of the Little Ice Age, the world's been warming at a steady half a degree per century, with this warming and cooling pattern superimposed on top of it. And he further pointed out that the IPCC, the official climate scientists, officially have basically taken that last warming period and just extrapolated it and said, oh, what, what happens if we do this? Well, you might think that's not what the, what the you might think that's exaggerated. They're not doing that. But take a look at this graph from the Australian Climate Commission. There's the actual temperatures, and then they're extrapolating it up wildly like this.